from Hollywood. It's time now for... Johnny Dollar. George Reed here. Well, hi, George. Haven't heard from you in a long time. Skip the formalities, Johnny. I have a problem. <laughs> you and everybody else. $25,000 problem. Possibly $50,000. Double indemnity clause, huh? Right. Who's insured? Name is Mercedes Crabtree. Crabtree? An elderly woman lives out in Montana. Uh-huh. And how long has the policy been in effect? Almost 30 years. And you're crying because you have to pay it off? Well, that's it, Johnny. We aren't sure. What? A few days ago, somebody took a shot at it. They missed. But... Yeah? Well, last night, she disappeared. Bob Bailey in the exciting adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account. America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. And now, act one of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Floyd's of England, American Branch Office, Hartford, Connecticut. Following is an account of expenses incurred during my investigation of the Silver Bell matter. Spell B-E-L-L-E. Expense account item 185 cents, taxi, from my apartment at George Reed's office. He was on his feet waiting for me. His suit looked like he'd slept in it. Close the door, Johnny. Yeah, sure. Johnny, I'm not going to mince words with you. This one's important, not only to me, but to Floyd. Oh, how come? Because Mrs. Crabtree was one of our first American clients, and because Murdoch Morton sold her that policy. Murdoch Morton? Who that? My goodness, Johnny. Mr. Morton's the president of our company. You should know that by now. Oh, yeah, I suppose I should. Yes. Well, at the time Mr. Morton sold her the policy, he and Mrs. Crabtree became very close friends. And where was Mr. Crabtree while all this was going on? He'd been killed in an accident in his mine six months before. Johnny, you have a very suspicious... I know, George. Prettier people than you have told me. Yes. Well, anyway, since that time, Mr. Morton and Mrs. Crabtree have corresponded regularly. And when Mr. Morton heard that someone had taken a shot at her... Now, wait a minute, George. Mr. Morton's in London, right? Yes. Well, just how did he happen to hear about the shooting? Through Mrs. Crabtree? No, uh, Mrs. Henrietta Scott wrote to him. Oh. And just who is Mrs. Henrietta Scott? According to her letter to Mr. Morton, she claims to be Mrs. Crabtree's only friend in Silver Ghost. Silver Ghost? Montana... It's where Mrs. Crabtree's lived for over half a century, and it's where Mr. Morton wants you to go immediately. Oh. When did Mrs. Crabtree disappear? Well, you received a telegram from Mrs. Scott early this morning. She was supposed to have dinner with Mrs. Crabtree last night and got up to her house, but it was empty. Uh -huh. well, she waited until midnight, checked again this morning, then wired us. Hmm. Who's the beneficiary on that life policy, George? Doesn't mean a thing. No? Why not? Well, only a couple of people know the policy exists. Also, the beneficiary happens to be Mrs. Crabtree's favorite charity. Good luck, Johnny. Oh, thanks, pal. I'm going to need it. Expense account item two, $178, air transportation to Butte, Montana. Item three, $14.90, bus fare, Butte to Silver Gulch. Like George had said, it wasn't much of a town. I checked into the Silver Queen Hotel, rented a battered Model T, and drove out to the home of Mrs. Henrietta Scott. me out of a day's growth. I'm sorry, Mrs. Scott? Yes. Oh, you must be from Grandma's trunk, yes. I uh, beg your pardon? Grandma's trunk. They sent you, didn't they? Well, come along with me. It's in the house. Uh, Mrs. Scott, wait a minute. I'm afraid you've made a mistake. You mean you're not from Grandma's trunk? I don't even know Grandma. It's an antique shop in Butte. Uh -huh. They said they'd send a man out to offer me a price for my hand-carved rosewood headboard. You're not him, huh? No, no. My name's Johnny Dollar. I'm an insurance investigator. Well, why didn't you say so right off? Come on inside. I suppose you're here about poor Mercedes Crabtree. God rest her soul. Yes, that's right. Is she still missing? Rest her soul. Uh, sit down anywhere. Oh. No, not there. Oh, oh well, I'm set to eat. That's it. You comfortable now? Oh, uh, fine, thanks. The sheriff and a couple of men who work for Charlie Greenpaw were out looking for her most of yesterday. They're at it again today, but they won't find her. Leastwise alive. Well, can you think of anyone who might have reason to kill her? Well... Now, that's hard to say. Most people in this town right now, they ain't got no use for her. Uh, they say she's stopping progress. 
Now, just what do you mean by stopping progress? Well, Charlie Greenpaw's busy getting some of the old buildings fixed up so they're livable again. He's planning on turning the whole town into a tourist attraction. Uh-huh. Well, Mercedes, she won't hold still for it. She won't let him set foot on any of her land. Won't sell none of it, neither. Does she own very much of the property around here? A little more than half of Main Street. Mm-hmm. And the thing that Charlie wants most, the Silver Bell. The Silver Bell? Which is Silver Mine in Nevada. Leastways, it was once. George Crabtree discovered it. Yes, when the not... vein ran out, he was killed trying to find it again. After that, the mine was closed. Uh, Mrs. Scott. Of course, the town closed down when the mine did. Uh, Mrs. Scott, were you with Mrs. Crabtree the day someone tried to shoot her? No. She was walking up toward her mine alone. Thought it was just a stray bullet. Uh, just where is this mine? Oh, you can see it from the window right behind you. It's about halfway up the hill yonder. Here, here, you come over here and take... Well, I'll be first cousin to a stink bug. Why? What is it? Up there on that hill going toward the mine. It's Charlie Greenpaw and Slim Richards, the sheriff's deputy. Now, I wonder if they think she's down inside that mine. A few minutes later, I caught up with Greenpaw and Richards. They'd stopped near a large, newly painted, no trespassing sign about 20 yards from the mine's entrance. I introduced myself. Mr. Dollar, you see that sign says no trespassing? Yeah. Well, folks around here take the signs Mrs. Crabtree had put up mighty seriously. That right, Slim? Sure is. You mean you're not going in there, Greenpaw? Well, now, we didn't say we weren't going in. We just thought we'd better consider it before we did anything hasty. But she could be dying in there. Providing she's in there. Right, Mr. Greenpaw? Yeah, that's right, Slim. Now, Dollar, you want to go on in? Why, there's nothing to stop you. No, sir. Not a thing. I left daylight behind as I followed the narrow tunnel deep into the side of the hill. About 50 yards down, the tunnel branched off in two different directions. I stopped for a moment, then took the one to the right. I hadn't gone 10 feet when it happened. Holy jump. Act two of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, in a moment. It is a rare event when a young man decides to leave civilization behind and hide himself away in the steaming jungle just so he can help his fellow humans in a remote corner of the world. The late Dr. Tom Dooley did just that when he left the United States to help the sick and starving jungle people in the little kingdom of Laos in Southeast Asia. Dr. Dooley's story is well known to nearly everyone. And all over the world, people talk of his little jungle hospital on stilts. That's where he treated the dread diseases of the jungle and trained native medical technicians so that they might help their own people. Dr. Dooley wrote and lectured to many people so that the work of his medical assistance program, Medico, might go on. It was not easy for someone so young and so talented to give up the bright lights of the city and plant himself down in an unknown jungle just for the purpose of helping unfortunate people he didn't even know. But through Medico, Dr. Tom Dooley wanted to help people. They wanted to help people to help themselves. Today, the work of Medico is going forward in a number of countries besides Laos. Young men are being sent to the United States to be schooled in medicine with the idea of returning to their own countries to help their own people. Hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of medical supplies have been donated by American businessmen and pharmaceutical companies. Today, Dr. Tom Dooley's work is being continued for him. It is helping to create better understanding. It is an injection of the spirit of freedom the right of all men everywhere. And now, act two of yours truly, Johnny Dollar and the Silver Bell Matter. I wasn't alone in the mine, that was for sure. But whoever was in there with me wanted to be alone and resented the intrusion. I wondered if they could hear, so I picked up a rock and tossed it on down the side of the tunnel. Oh, oh. 
the end. Mrs. Crabtree, is that you? You're trying to trick me. No, 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 wait a minute. My name's Johnny Dollar, insurance investigator. I've got a feed on you now, mister. So don't you move till you can prove what you're saying. Oh, no, I don't intend to. What are you doing in my mind? Looking for you. Your friend, Mr. Morton, is worried about you. Mr. Dollar, but you be mighty careful about it. Yes, ma'am, I sure will. You say my Doc Morton sent you all the way out here? That's right, ma'am. Your friend, Mrs. Scott, wrote to him. I declare. I've seen forgot she even knew. You know my Doc? No, ma'am, I've never had the pleasure. Oh, he's such a fine gentleman. I remember years ago when I first met him. Oh, he was so kind and understanding. Hey, what's the matter? Oh, crazy fool thing I did coming in here and falling... Hurt myself bad, too. Mr. Dollar, you're just going to have to carry me out. It'll be a pleasure. She couldn't have weighed more than 80 pounds, six-shooter and all. I carried her out of the mine and down the hill to her cabin. I had just finished making her as comfortable as I could when Mrs. Scott arrived. Oh, dear. Oh, you poor old dear thing. Uh you ever hear such thick garbage, Mr. Dollar? Woman, stop looking like you buried me yesterday and run and get the doctor to take care of my ankle. Your ankle? Well, what's the matter with it? Well, it's busted. Ooh. Now, why do you think Mr. Dollar had to carry me? Oh, dear. Is there a doctor in Silver Gulch? Doc Weaver, he's pretty old, oh, but he's... he doctored me for almost 40 years. Go get him, Henrietta, before I get mad at you for tattling to Miss Morton. Yes, dear, yes. Yes, I'll do it. I'll do it right now. <sighs> Now then, Mr. Dollar, you come over and sit by me. Keep you company till the doc gets here. Yeah, sure. Hey, you know, you really ought to rest. Why don't you start asking me questions, Mr. Dollar? You came all the way out here to do that, now, didn't you? <laughs> well, there are a few things I'm curious about. Like what? Now, for one thing, why you took those shots at me in the mine. Huh. Thought you might be one of Charlie Greenpaw's friends. Oh, he's the man who's trying to buy your mine, isn't he? But I ain't going to sell it. No, sir. No matter how much he offers. You believe the mine could be worked again someday? Might be. Somebody could find the vein again. But that ain't why I won't sell. It's because my husband, he's buried in there, Mr. Dollar. Him and the others that were caught in that cave-in. Oh, I see. I've told them all. If they set one foot on my property, I'm going to shoot first and ask questions later. Aren't you afraid someone might shoot back one of these days? Oh, haven't so far. That's not what Mrs. Scott told us. I know what she told you, and she's mistaken. By that bullet missed me by a good two feet. You don't think it could have been a warning? No, I don't. People in these parts, if they wanted to fight me, there are better ways of doing it than that. Well, if that's so, I sure hope they don't try any of them. No one, at least so far as she knew, had reason enough to try killing her. Not even Charlie Greenpaw, although she refused to cooperate with the Silver Gulch Improvement Committee. I waited until Mrs. Scott returned with the doctor, then left and drove back to my hotel. I had finished supper and was heading toward my room when someone called me. Oh, Mr. Dollar. Yeah? Oh, Mr. Greenpaw, I was just thinking about you. That's so? Yeah, yeah, I was wondering why you hadn't thought to take a look in the Silver Bell mine when you first heard that Mrs. Crabtree was missing. Well, to tell the truth, I'd left the search up to the sheriff until today. Then this morning, Isabel, that's my wife, she said if something did happen to Mrs. Crabtree, it sure looked like I did it. Good thing you listened, because she was right. Yes, I know. Say, Dollar, I hear Mrs. Crabtree's taking quite a shine to you. Oh, where'd you hear that? Doc Weaver said that's all she talked about. Hey, look, if you'd like to pick yourself up a few hundred dollars, you sure could do it easy. Oh, how's that? Just get the old lady to sell me her mine and the acreage along next to Mrs. Scott's place. Uh -huh. I'd give her full value for both. And they'd come to enough money for her to live on the rest of her life real comfortable. Now, you do that dollar, and I'll give you $1,000 cash. You know something, Greenpaw? What's that? I could have been mistaken about you. You want that mine and the land around it real bad, don't you? Sure. I spent a good deal of money fixing up the old buildings here in town. If I can get the Silver Bell and enough land out there to put a dude ranch on, why, this town will be able to make Virginia City look second rate. Now, uh, what do you say? I don't know. I'll relay your proposition to Mrs. Crabtree. The rest is... What's all the excitement out there? Well, it Miss sounds Green like... Paul. Miss Greenpaw! Miss What is it, Slim? What's going on? Fire! Miss Crabtree's cabin. It's blazing like fury. <laughs>
Act three of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, in a moment. For thousands of years, the oceans of the world have taken their toll of the treasures of the people who live near them or travel over them in calm and in storm. And for an equally long time, these same people have dived to the bottoms of these oceans seeking those treasures, gold, silver, jewels, and emblems of tradition or symbols of history have been the sought-after prizes. Late in 1959, a group of English divers seeking underwater specimens of fish and plant life off the coast of the island of Teixeira in the Azores came across a group of some 17 ancient cannons. They'd been swept off the walls of the old fortress by a tidal wave sometime during the middle of the 19th century and sank about 100 feet to the bottom of frequently storm-swept waters. News of the discovery was relayed to the Portuguese government, which gave permission for the raising of the relics. American skin divers stationed at the Air Force base on Teixeira volunteered to do the job on off-duty hours. In cooperation with the Portuguese Museum, the men made a few exploratory dives to determine the situation. Then the salvage work began. After cleaning the cannons, some made of brass, others of bronze, it was discovered that they had been forged in England, France, and Portugal more than 110 years before. Now the shiny symbols of history are on view in a Portuguese museum. The Portuguese people are happy because of an unselfish American gesture that brought back to them their symbols of the defense of freedom, the right of all men everywhere. And now, act three of yours truly, Johnny Dollar and the Silver Bell Matter. By the time we reached the cabin, it was all over. For a moment, I was afraid Mrs. Crabtree hadn't managed to escape. Then I saw her on the ground near the sheriff's car, wrapped in blankets. Hey, you! Get back over there! It's all right, Sheriff. This is Mr. Dollar. Oh, I heard you're in town, Mr. Dollar. This is Sheriff Wilkins, Johnny. Sheriff, do you have any idea how this fire started? Not yet, I don't. I asked her, but... I'd rather not talk about it now, Johnny. Maybe, maybe some other time. Whatever you say. She's pretty done in. Johnny? Yeah? You tell Mr. Greenpaw. Tell him I'll sell. Will you do that for me? Well, I... Well, look, I'll talk to you about it in the morning. No. I want to sell now. Nothing to stay here for. Nothing. We'd better get it down to Mrs. Scott's place. Doc Weaver's given us some morphine. You go ahead, Sheriff. I'm going on back to town. Sure. See you later, Dollar. Oh, Mr. Dollar. Is she going to be all right? Yeah. Yeah, I think so. Greenport, do you have a map of this area, including all the land you're planning on buying? Not on me. It's down at the office. You want to see it tonight? Yeah, I sure do. I took a look at the map. Got a little sick at my stomach. Then drove back to Henrietta Scott's. There was a light on in the front room, so I got out of the car and walked up to the door. Johnny Dollar, Mrs. Scott. Oh? Well, isn't it a little late to come calling, Mr. Dollar? I mean, after all, Mrs. Crabtree is sleeping sound, and I'm all ready for bed. I want to see Mrs. Crabtree. I want you to wake her up. Well, I just couldn't do that. The doctor told me she should have as much sleep as she can get. Yeah, you took his orders a little too literally, Mrs. Scott. By whatever do you mean? I mean trying to burn her house down with her still in it. What? Yes. She trusted you. She thought you were the only person she could trust. Then when she found out different, she decided to sell her land and get away from here. Why, that's a pack of the biggest lies I ever did hear. Now, what reason would I have for wanting to hurt the poor old dear? Money. Money? You own most of the land adjoining the Crabtree property, including that around the Silver Bell. Greenpaw wouldn't buy your land unless he could buy Mrs. Crabtree's. When she refused to sell, you decided to see that that property changed hands the hard way. If that's so, why would I be so concerned about her? Now, why would I write Mr. Morton telling him she'd been shot at and then wiring when she disappeared? Why? To protect yourself. You purposely missed her that day. You had to set up your alibi. You've got no proof. No, no, you're right. I haven't. But Mrs. Crabtree has. She knows who and what started that fire in a cabin. Now, get out of my way. No. Oh, oh. Crabtree, 
This is Crabtree. Huh? What is it? All right, Mr. Dollar. You move away from her. Not until I find move out. Move away now or I'll shoot. Oh, well, when you put it that way, Mrs. Scott, I'll, I'll have to. You were right about me missing her on purpose. Anybody's lived up here long as I have. They don't miss with a rifle good as this one. Mr. Dollar? No, you... Mr. Dollar, she started the fire. Mercedes, you shut up. You, you try and make me. Maybe I will, like I should have before. You see that... Oh, no, you don't. No. Don't. Give me that rifle, no. lady. No! Why? Why did you have to ruin it? Somebody had to. You okay, Mrs. Crabtree? Yes. Did I... Did I do good getting her attention? You... You did just fine. I was ready to leave Silver Gulch the next day. But I stayed over for another week, waiting for a little English gentleman by the name of Murdoch Morton to arrive and claim his bride. Yeah, just about everybody in Montana came to Mrs. Crabtree... Pardon me. Mrs. Morton's wedding. Everybody that is but her old friend, Mrs. Henrietta Scott. Expense account total, $317.10. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. And now here is our star to tell you about next week's story. Next week, a beautiful girl is killed. And with her goes a big part of my own heart. It's one of those things that... Well, join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, originates in Hollywood. Written by Charles B. Smith, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Heard in our cast were Virginia Gregg, D.J. Thompson, G. Stanley Jones, Frank Nelson, Sam Edwards, and Will Wright. Be sure to join us next week, same time and station, for another exciting story of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. This is Dan Coverly speaking. United States Armed Forces Radio and Television Service. <laughs>